Several hours, over the next about three hours, I have the privilege of getting to interview a whole bunch of folks. So we're going to do a series of 30-minute interviews, and um, every one of them is unscripted, every one of them is unprepped, meaning they don't know the questions I'm going to ask. Um, if you saw Inside the Actor's Studio ever, right, with Jonathan Lipton and the stack of blue index cards with the, what was your fourth grade teacher's, or actually they say, like, tell me who Mr. Johnson is, right? And then they're like, oh my god, that was my fourth grade great teacher and um, I didn't do that much research right so I just, I just want to set the stage right drive the bar low for expectation um, but it should be a lot of fun and uh, and so we're gonna get started and we're gonna start with Ashley so um, if you missed it Ashley already spoke here at WordCamp Albuquerque um, but now you get the redux right you get the opportunity to come back and hear some more and Ashley I want to start by asking you um, you have a design role at automatic right a company that has been known for a very long time as being engineering centric and you're doing something that isn't engineering centric per se but really is helping the organization move forward and think about how it addresses the millions of people that it interacts with what's the hardest part about your job hmm. well I think the hardest part about it really is kind of what John was speaking to a little bit earlier, like getting on the same page about like the audiences that we're, we're reaching, right? What the, what the challenges are, what their really particular and different needs are so that they become more human and we can develop and design to actually meet their needs. Um, it's challenging, especially when we've, I think the, the traditional way of, um, of working was kind of assuming that our end customers, our, our users have similar needs to our own. And so kind of rediscovering what the actual um, end use cases are, where we're tripping them up, both in like communications and how we're marketing our products, as well as in how we're, we're building them and adjusting them over time. Um, it's just a big learning curve for us um, that is like a collaborative effort to get through. Well, in the, in the software world, right, we have this notion of, oh, I'm just scratching my own itch, right, which leads to people looking really rashy, but also the, the, the consequence is you do presume that, well, everybody itches in the same place I itch, and that's not reality, right? So instead of going from the inside out and telling the world, here's what we think is a better move, right, you're really trying to bring it from the outside in, right? This is what people uh, need, this is what they're struggling with is what they want and bring it in. How receptive have you found the organization, the people you're working with, which isn't really an automatic issue. It's just a general issue, right? It's a very human issue. Yeah. How, how hard is it to help people get out of their own shoes, put themselves outside, and figure out, okay, what do, what do other people need? You know, it actually hasn't been that hard. It's, it's like the practice of doing it and making it like a ritual that everybody does enough, right? Because um, it's, I think, easy for John to get some great... Um, case studies traveling around talking to small business users and saying what their needs are and like connecting it to the product for people to see um, see the need there but making that like an actual <laughs> it's like an actual habit of ours to um, each speak to our end customers and break our um, in some ways personas can be bad right if you get too locked into like one idea of what that customer looks like to break those ideas down continually um, and to reshape the stereotypes. Um, so there's there's a lot of initial buy-in. It's it's more like how do we get that practice in place where that becomes something that we do together regularly, and um, it like the listening and the discovery um, that you kind of saw in John's slides just a little while ago that that becomes part of um, what we do in the development process and the design process, and that is connected to our support teams um, so that we. We've got like a full cycle of support and a like cross organizational focus on on this. Um, so it's really just getting that practice, like anything, right? You're like you know you practice to get that big music role. Like it takes 
building up the muscle, kind of breaking it down and making it um, just a part of the reality that happens over time. But I've been really impressed with the initial interest and buy-in and the support that we've gotten from like heads of each of our uh, divisions and products uh, on such a kind of radical change of thinking. Yeah. You don't ever hear anyone complain when you first initiate the whole, uh, we should ask what end users want or what they struggle with. Or, like Nobody goes, no, I don't want to talk to them. <laughs> it's just that practice part, right? Putting in place. Now, you did a lot of work before Automatic with the White House, um, a place that I would presume also was spending a lot of time matching up both internal initiative and policy and everything else you're doing with the outside world, right? And, and bringing that in. Did you guys develop certain practices on how to listen to people or how to collect that information that is applicable broader than to just when you're at the White House? Yeah, I mean, there's some ways, surprisingly, <laughs> that the government gets it right. Um, there are some parts of policy development where it's natural to draft it and then you're legally required to have um, like conversational periods where you get comments and you collect comments. Um, like that's an amazing practice that could be applied to our like design and development processes um, that that doesn't really happen right now. I wouldn't limit it to just like that certain point, like your initial round or like version one of something. Um, but it was so excellent to be in a situation where we have that like infrastructure in place with policy. Um, I learned a lot from our legal counsel at the White House, uh, like to my surprise. But one of the big things that I learned is like the how important precedent is for me getting anything done at the White House. So <laughs> I look for any precedent of what's been done before and use that as a case for building up where we needed to go in the future. Um, and that policy precedent was a really big one for us to start to experiment and figure out how we could do it on the design and development side as well. Well, we listen to our constituents when it comes to policy development. Like, why wouldn't we when we're building the sites that communicate that policy to them? Um, so, yeah, I think there's there's a certain amount of like practice. It's almost like liturgical at the White House with like policy development that like can be integrated into um, private sector processes and um, um, even just. I'd say it was less of like a culture initiative uh, in the White House. Like building up that side was a little bit harder. Um, so it's been good to see that that's there's always some cultural change that needs to happen. But that's not our number one struggle um, in automatic right now in WordPress.com. And one of the ha one of the things that happens when you, you built the platform for all the people that wanted to comment on policy and, and petitions and everything else, and uh, anytime you create that that window where you have to listen to people, right? You also get to listen to the minority voice, right? It's not just the overwhelming majority that's speaking all the time. There's that notion of listening for something you weren't expecting, something that was different, or a, a voice that was representing an entire community that you weren't really paying attention to. Um, you you are are a, a champion for inclusion, um, focused on, on diversity. How important are developing those disciplines around listening for inclusion? I mean, it, it's essential. It's like the base foundation for it, because you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> so you've got to discover and find out and create space for that. Um, and like trying to make it as democratic and as open as possible is certainly a challenge for, like you're kind of um, alluding to We the People, our petitions platform that we built. Um, it took a lot of discovery to figure out like what's the right threshold for a petition to become publicly visible, right? Like you don't want as soon as it gets created for it to be publicly visible. It's like lots of spammy stuff, <laughs> really bad quality. Um, but you don't want it to be so high that somebody with like a limited social network can't like get it to the point where more people can see it and sign on. So like figuring out like where that balance is that um, that folks who may be a little bit more disenfranchised have a chance of actually getting their voice and their perspective in front of um, the White House. Um, and then and you know technical side things like. 
first everybody had to make an account in order to even sign a petition, which is, I mean, you've got, there's a lot of trust involved in creating <laughs> an right. account on. I don't want my email platform. at the White House platform, right? Yeah, yeah, you know, and like, can you imagine if, you know, uh, before Dreamers, you had folks who were like brought here and they're not like as young kids, like not, um, sure like what their status is for citizenship and wanting to have a real dialogue and that sort of thing and being like well like is this going to get me <laughs> like kicked out of the country and trying to open a dialogue on this very same issue so one of our, our big changes there and just lowering the bar to entry um, and like making things more inclusive was to just take out the process for signatures you still needed to create an account to author a petition, but in order to sign a petition, like to not have to like create an account. Um, so there's so many different ways that it applies, but back to your question, yeah, I think it's like the base foundation, this kind of listening and being really intentional about um, like allowing everybody to share so that you're not like listening, but um, you know, with people, to people who just are on the same wavelength or have the same audio frequency as you because um, they have access to the technology and they're already paying attention to the, you know, WordPress community forums or something. That's a very specific group. Right. Well, that's that's one of the challenges we have in the WordPress ecosystem, right? Because we talk about there's all the people that are using WordPress, right? They can't spell it with a capital P, but they can actually, you know, submit a blog post somewhere. Then you have the people who know there's a capital P. They go to WordCamps. That's a smaller group of people, but that's still a larger group of people. Then you have the people who contribute code to it, right? Much smaller community, capital C, right? Those are people that, that have... Engaged. Yeah, hyper engaged. And part of the dynamic is we tell the whole world, right, it's open source. Anybody can contribute, right? But then they submit a ticket somewhere like, hey, this didn't work. And someone goes and changes the status to won't fix, which is painful for me, right? Every, I mean, it's my only, like someone once asked, what would you change if you could change anything? I'm like, just that phrase to like, hey, we're looking at this and maybe we'll think about it later would still feel better than won't fix, right? Like, you just reject rejected me as a person, not my submission, right? It feels painful. But, but you have this dynamic of, if, if I, I just read some, someone submitted a ticket, two years go by, nothing happens, right? Then someone else who's in the hyper-engaged community looks at it and goes, oh, we got to fix this right away, right? And then it gets fixed, and you feel, gosh, I'm kind of happy that the thing got fixed, but I'm also being told indirectly that me reporting it wasn't worth, you know, the, whoever this person was, right, wasn't worthy enough to report it. Only a big name got to, right? And so the inclusivity that we want, even in the contribution, right, or there are little forms on some WordCamps that say, um, do you, have you contributed to WordPress, right? But it, it, what does that mean, right? Like, did I donate? Did I show up and put food on the table? Did I run the meetup? Did I speak? It's or is it in terminology. It's, well, you wrote code, yeah. right? Like, so then the, all the other people are disenfranchised, and you're like, ah, so part of the figuring out of inclusivity in the WordPress community is figuring out what are the on-ramps, right? How do we develop on-ramps for people who aren't all senior developers? Yeah, right? and we all need we need that to grow the ecosystem and the community right. further, right? It's not going to grow if we keep kind of our own closed bubble of people who can contribute easily. It's going to grow when we like enfranchise others to contribute in a like regular way with the technology they already have available. Um, there's, go. I think there's probably always going to be a little bit of a learning curve, but how can we like lessen that and make it something that's um, that's manageable and like show the benefits of it? It's, it's a really good challenge. Those so we need to we the people for we the <laughs> for, for we the WordPress. You can right? Like I mean, there's no reason. Like like can people email? their ideas and it goes it still goes to I think you just right send it to john at nineseeds.com right <laughs> is that what it is we just send everything to john uh, yeah but, but that it, we have we have to find the ways right to, to drive inclusivity uh, when you decided to come to automatic I mean obviously you, had, you were doing a lot of amazing things incredible things what made you say I want to join automatic and work with wordpress well, a few things. So, I mean, lots of great conversations with John. <laughs> I, was, I was like, what's automatic? Oh, I know WordPress. What's automatic? I don't know. <laughs> I was one of those. You can judge me. It's okay. Um, but, you know, basically,
based on the time, it was kind of a growing recognition for me of the importance of tech um, communities in a really broad sense and um, like enfranchising, empowering, democratizing so that more people could share their, their voice and perspective um, to go against the closed garden ecosystem that was leading towards, you know, fake news and influencing elections. Um, so like all of that had, um, you know, a huge part to do with it. Um, um, we need people sharing their their voices and engaging in real dialogues with one another um, in areas that they don't agree. Um, I couldn't guarantee, I was happy that We the People lasted a little bit longer than our administration was one of our goals. Um, we can't guarantee that that's going to happen when the administration changes. We need to build up these types of tools um, and the awareness and the like the passion for that type of dialogue and conversation in the much broader community. Any change happens from a community first way. Um, so as our administration split up, as we had to, we had no opportunity to stay on and try to influence the person in charge now. But as we kind of rolled out, I think if you could connect the dots, you could see that there's actually a lot of commonality in where people um, for the Obama administration ended up. Uh, President Obama opened up the foundation. Instead of just being like a library where people could go, it is community organizing. It's empowering people um, really to, uh, to help grow their communities, to um, get others to participate in civic dialogues that affect policy or just you know in their local neighborhood or in a much broader sense. Um, so we need to do that across industry and I think like who can deny the power of WordPress? What are we at now? Twenty nine percent of oh yeah. my gosh. Like that's a huge opportunity that we have that we shouldn't take for granted. That's awesome. Uh, you, if I remember correctly, right, you went to RISD, right, the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, that's not a casual, relaxed environment to do design, is it? No. No, it's, <laughs> it's hard work. So um, what did you take away from your experience there that kind of propelled you or helped you through your career going forward? Um, a lot of things, like, it was hard for me to go to RISD because, like, financial reasons, um, feeling like, you know, my family was investing in it. So when I was there, I was on, like, 200% all the time. I worked, um, and I, like, aimed for the A. We didn't have A pluses. I don't know why. I aimed for the A in every, every class that I could. I, I paid as close attention as I could to learn and grow, and I felt a little bit still inside the ecosystem like an, an outsider because I cared about like social good stuff before a lot of my peers did. So they're like, make a stamp and we're designing stamps and I'm like, this is for the post-apartheid <laughs> South African <laughs> environment. Encourage people about empowerment. And they're like, sign a stamp, Ashley. Just sign a stamp. Um, but, you know, I, I think I learned to give like my all to everything that we um, every challenge that came my way and to seek everything as an opportunity. I had these great professors too who like didn't just uh, go, I think a lot of design schools do this, who like focus on the foundations which are usually considered the type, hierarchy, visuals, things like that. They didn't just let us um, rest there and get those foundations right. We had to do um, a case study on every project that we finished and produce a book to document our process and talk about our learnings. And so we'd have these solid materials for each one. And we didn't even get to keep them when we were done. We had to hand them over. <laughs> so you kind of learn to put everything into it to be really thoughtful and then to, to kind of hand it over to a broader community that I think, I mean, you can kind of drill into that any way that you want, but like all of that kind of crosses over and influenced how I work now. One of the things I appreciate about it is that notion of introspection, right? The, after you finish the work, to go back and look at the work and then the lessons learned and what you do. And we, we have something like that in software development. It just isn't always widely practiced. It's more widely talked about than practiced, right? Um, but a postmortem, a notion of let's go back and learn. Um, 
and yet it doesn't happen as often, right? And you guys do it religiously there, right? A, like every project, you're going to go back and look over, you know, what you did and what you learned. How does that introspection help you with insights, right? How, how does it develop kind of that notion of, of developing kind of a, a reflection, a practice of reflection or insights to help you kind of propel forward? Like you can't grow if you don't really learn and really internalize the lessons from the last process and, and projects. So it's, I don't know, it's like a, for, a forcing mechanism to, um, to like ingest and repeat and like really hold those lessons dear so that you don't repeat the mistakes that you made in the past, that you can grow from them and, and move forward. Um, I don't know if that exactly answers your and question. If you, if, you were, if you were encouraging, right, this audience to develop that habit or that practice, what yeah. tips might you give them so they could start doing more reflection? Um, like document along the way is pretty huge, even if it's small, like scrappy things. <laughs> like um, I'm doing, like think about why you're making decisions along the, the along the course of a project. I'm doing this because I think it will have this effect. I, I'm doing this because I heard this thing, and so I'm I'm taking it the next step further. And then as you find out some of those assumptions, some of that data was slightly off or on, you'll, you'll be able to say, you'll be able to kind of track the, the momentum across it. But I think that the documentation is key. And it'll, it'll probably at first, if you're not in the habit of doing it, feel really silly and like you're collecting a bunch of nonsense that nobody else cares about. Um, but for me, that's been a just a really important part of it is kind of being relentless and documenting um, like the thinking behind pieces and making notes about those decision points. I, I find that one of the other pieces I try and have my teams do is write down what they're not going to do and why they're not going to do it, right? Because you get two months later or six months later and uh, suddenly someone comes up with this new brilliant idea, right? Why don't you do it like this? And you're thinking, oh, maybe we should look into that instead of going back and going, no, 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 we decided not to do that and here's why we did Oh, right, right, okay, right? But it, do, it just helps you from getting distracted. It helps you know kind of this is the path we're on yeah what the focus what the goal is all those all those things if you saw the worksheet that I put up earlier for the road mapping through the moment like at the top of that was like a reminder on like the purpose of this event the goal of it the audience keeping those really foundational things like across the project is uh, is key and then you can always grow the audience or kind of split and have more in the future but that focus is really important those are good points how many of you are designers in the room? Okay, good amount. Um, so you also did, did a lot with AIG, AIGA. I almost said AIGI. Uh, and you were the president in the DC group, right? And now you're on the national level, right? Um, so you've spoken at a bunch of conferences. You've interacted with a whole bunch of designers. Uh, I find that every time I talk to a designer or freelancer developer, right, I find that they're all still struggling through many of the same challenges over and over, right? Clear communication, managing expectations and the big one, charging what they're worth. Um, do you have any tips for how to help someone know what they should be charging or how to get the courage up to ask for it? Honestly, like community and conversation is huge. That's one of the biggest benefits of AIGA is that you're in community with other designers. Um, this kind of gets into another like administration Obama thing, but one of our big things in like combating um, gender pay discrimination during the second term of the, uh, the administration was just getting businesses to commit to allowing people to have conversations about pay and not having that be like a fireable offense. Because um, you don't know, you might not know that somebody's getting paid significantly more than you and that like you're being undervalued and that there's um, an imbalance there. I think similarly in the design community, if you want to know like what the going rate is for your work and be paid um, to your worth, being in community with, with folks and having really open dialogues about it. AIGA also has um, a solid number of resources online for if you're starting out freelancing, the types of contracts, um, 
like the starting rates and some of that stuff just to kickstart it. But that's that's only one like that's only one kind of framework to reference because we all know it changes depending on where you are and the environment ecosystem that you're in. So really finding that community and being in dialogue I think is the biggest piece, biggest benefit for me at least with AIGA and then also the biggest piece about um, really getting paid what you're, what you're worth is knowing what the going rates are. Um, and also just track business. I think designers keep some, or tend to keep some distance from business speak and like business terms, but read about business, pick up the like Harvard Business Review every once in a while, like be in the know because that's um, like the broader industry that you're in when you're freelancing or, um, or kind of bidding on, on um, contracts and projects. So you've kind of got to know the lingo and be a little bit more involved. That'll allow you to be kind of sharper and have an edge. It's awesome. We have just a few minutes left with Ashley. I want to open it up in case any of you have questions for her. So raise your hand, I'll call on you, and we'll get the question in front of her. I don't bite. You can also if like you're introverted, ask you can me text Sean, weird. and then he'll bring it up. <laughs> yeah, constantly. So, so earlier I heard your presentation, you had a screenshot of um, the HOTUS Twitter handle being used for the first time and Bill Clinton responding to that. Was that like pre planned? Or, or like, <laughs> uh-huh. No, it was not actually. Um, uh, it's kind of you know, friendly banter type of thing. I, um, I will say it's, it's very likely that somebody in our team let them know the day that it was going to come out, but it wasn't a planned thing at all. Um, and the president was very excited to finally get on Twitter. We were talking about it for a long time. I helped him pick out his profile image. Because <laughs> the last thing you want the president to do is look through images for one that he feels like is good. For her. <laughs> it's like, here are a few options, pick one. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I was worried for a little while that that's what he thought my job was because I'd <laughs> like come up with these weird things and be like, I swear I do a lot more than this, sir, but can you, can can you, you pick which picture? Pick, can you pick a picture for your profile? <laughs> like, that's the picture, girl. No, that's not my job, right? <laughs> I do. That's right. Any other questions? Yeah. From your time in the White House, is there any one thing that you were, one thing that you were most proud of, maybe that not other people saw? Something maybe behind the scenes or something. Um, there's so many things. But one of the ones that always comes to mind for questions like that is that um, when we felt so lucky to be included in this environment and to be able to influence so much with our time there, we're incredibly hard with that. Um, but some of the best times where we were able to extend that feeling and that kind of gets into inclusion again, but extend that inclusion to others. Um, one thing that we did is we created the, a White House Student Film Festival. Festival. Our office just kind of invented it. The first uh, version we made it about the importance of STEM education, and we asked K through 12 folks to submit across the country videos, and then we watched all of them and picked out winners. And we had a red carpet event for them that we live streamed for the winners. Um, had the president speak to them, and they got to sit in the White House, like they did red carpet interviews with Bill Nye, the Science Guy, and Neil. Grass Tyson and um, sit in the White House and watch their videos be screened. Um, and like for us, putting that on and kind of making that tor- type of like acceptance and um, like empowerment um, expansive to like future generations. We were like crying on the side. We're like, Shelly, we love your video. And she came back to the second student film festival. Just like really proud of um, the kids themselves and that like impact that we're able to um, show them that their government cares about them and cares about their creative voice in some some way. Well, their voice is given a platform, yeah. right? And that's huge. So. Yeah, I could awesome. cry just thinking. We got one more there. Mm-hmm. Well, so a lot of us are going to be going to the marches tomorrow around here, and then some are going on now. You being the genius about this, <laughs> if, if you could give advice to somebody who is promoting this kind of movement, 
what's an idea that just comes into your mind? How would you promote it? How would you, or how would you do some things differently so that it, we would be taken more seriously? As marchers, as folks as, going in? As the whole event, the whole, uh, giving it more importance, which is what you obviously are going to do. I would say, like, kind of democratize it. Like, people march for different reasons. Sometimes folks don't know what to put on their sign. Like, the smallest thing can keep somebody from coming out because they're like, there are all these beautiful signs. I don't have any witty comments. Like, like templatizing it, having to fill in the blank. Like, I march for blank and letting them fill it in. Um, having those available, having giant Sharpies and letting people just come out and write in their thing so that people can bring their own their own reason to it um, and feel like they're part of the, the movement and the movement's welcoming them. Anything that you can do to um, to kind of lower again the barrier to entry to, to coming out is really useful. Those um, beautiful signs that get printed in thousands for the March on Washington, as much as we can kind of get those things out where people can just pick it up and, um, and march, I think is really empowering and um, making like kid-friendly versions and stuff, of course. I love seeing, you know, cross-generational. Which I think two of those themes are valuable, not just there, which is awesome, but also in the WordPress community, right? How do you engage youth and cross-generational and create, give them voice, give them platform, invite them and help them feel important in it? And also, how do you just keep lowering the barrier, right? The more you can lower the barrier, the easier it is, the less friction then people can feel like, yeah, I want to come in. Well, let's give it up for Ashley. Thank you very much. We're going to take just a couple minute break and then we'll uh, start again.